This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. My name is Chris Ansell and I'm director of the Travers Program at UC Berkeley, which is sponsoring this conference along with the Commonwealth Club and the Goldman School of Public Policy. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you today the moderator for the next panel, Robert Shireman. Bob recently left his post at, as uh, uh, Undersecretary of uh, Education in the Obama administration where he was the main force behind efforts to reform the financial aid process. He's been a long-term, ad long-time advocate for greater access to higher education and was formerly president uh, of the Institute of College Access and Success, which is here in the Bay Area, based here in the Bay Area. And he's currently leading a foundation-sponsored project on higher education and the California economy. We actually asked him to sit on the panel originally, and he, he said, well, he has to be a kind of stand above the, the fray a little bit for, in, this, in this new job he has. Well, the reason I asked Bob to be the moderator was really quite practical. Uh, when he went to Washington to work for the Obama administration, he told some of his friends here in Berkeley that he said, I'm going to go just for one year. And we all said, hmm, sure, sure. And one year later, he came back to Berkeley. So I decided. This man has a real talent for time management. <laughs> and I thought he knows how to get the job done. And so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, turn this over to Bob Sharman. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. Well, the, the, the real story was uh, that uh, when Chris called me was, I, I said, I, I don't want to have opinions yet. I need to spend some time uh, listening, and uh, then I'll have, I'll have some opinions later. Uh, and the real story about coming back to California was uh, there I was in Washington, D.C., in my home state, born and raised. Uh, uh, and and I, I looked at what was happening in Washington, D.C., and it was uh, a mess and lots of problems. And then I looked at what was happening in California, and it was a bigger mess. Um, and a lot more problems, and uh, I felt like uh, I, I have to go home, and I have to be, I have to be a part of figuring out what we, uh, what what California can can do and needs to do, and uh, I re I'm really looking forward to uh, to this panel. And part of what I have uh, seen is that we all. We all worry when we hear about cuts to higher education and we think, oh, oh no, it means tuition increases, or oh no, it means some seats won't be filled. But we don't go to the next step, the next question of wh what does this mean for the future of the state? What does this mean about the kind of thriving economy and society that we have had in past decades, that we all want to have in future decades? And there's really not anyone on the left or the right or in between who thinks that, uh, that education doesn't have a big part of reaching that thriving economy and competing with the rest of the states in the country, competing with the world. And that's why I've gotten involved now in a project not yet formally announced, but really looks at uh, uh, where, where do we need to go in this state? Because if we don't know where we're trying to go with our higher education system, uh, this, I suppose this is sort of like the uh, uh, the, the Yogi Berra quote, if, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to get there. And uh, we don't know where we're going. We, we, we know there are cuts, and we're worried about the cuts, but there's no perspective on what does that mean for the future of the state. So we're looking 10, 15 years out about where we need to go, looking at what the current situation means for the state of California, um, and uh, hoping to chart a path and figure out how we get back on track. Uh, part of that is going to be dealing with these short-term budget cuts, but the longer term is where uh, is what really matters. So I'm looking forward to the conversation, uh, both with, a, with, with an eye to the immediate budget issues, but also with an eye to 
the longer term and setting up some of those, those things we need to be thinking of, about longer term in the process of de dealing with these uh, short term uh, budget cuts. So we have a, a great panel, a complicated algorithm uh, involving all the substance and the alphabet was used to uh, determine the order of listing in the uh, program. We're actually going to upset that algorithm and uh, still start with B, Chancellor Bergino will go first, uh, but uh, then we're gonna go to two folks who, uh, so we'll start with a physicist, uh, and the, the, the detailed bios are in, the, uh, are, are in your program, but I thought I'd just give little, uh, little snapshots. Um, and uh, uh, Chancellor Bergino is the leader of, of Berkeley, the, uh, the preeminent campus in, in the system, is one of the most um, important critical spokespeople for California higher education, looked to worldwide as all around the world, they still want to be like UC Berkeley, like the UC system. Um, uh, we will then go to two people who I think will give us some national perspective. Uh, Bill Zameda, um, who uh, is at University of Washington, uh, leading researcher in higher education. I usually think of him as, as in his association with the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education and the, the, the grading of state policies around the country. Um, he'll give us uh, his, his perspective. And then uh, Dennis Jones, who's with the uh, National Center for Higher Education Management Systems. Dennis is the person that uh, a state legislative committee or a state higher education agency will call him in Colorado and say, can you come out and spend a couple weeks with us and uh, uh, tell us about ourselves? Um, uh, tell us, tell us from an from a outside expert consultant's data-oriented perspective what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And much like a doctor who tells you, you need to exercise more and eat healthy foods, it doesn't mean the states do it. It just means they know what they're supposed to do if they really were trying to get, get where they needed to go. So uh, Dennis, will give us, uh, Dennis will give us that, uh, that perspective. Uh, and then we will go back to uh, a Californian, um, uh, Steve Weiner, who uh, has kind of tasted all of the different pieces of the higher education system, private colleges. You see uh, the accreditation uh, system, which is a critical and often forgotten element uh, of, of, of higher education. So uh, to uh, start things off, I welcome Chancellor Bergenau. Okay. Thank you so much. And, <laughs> and great to have you back. Great, thank you. So, uh, I'm not going to give the pitch on why education is important, et cetera. I think every single person here will accept the basic uh, uh, principles that we operate under. And I thought I would just try and briefly, uh, in, 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 uh, with Berkeley as an example, because it's the place I understand best, just uh, give you some picture of uh, where we are in terms of, the, of our funding uh, algorithm and, uh, and what that uh, and some of the poli policy impl possible policy implications uh, uh, for that, which I think are quite uh, in in interesting, and I'll be a little bit provocative uh, also, which usually panels like this prefer. Uh, so uh, I've been Chancellor of Berkeley for six and a half years uh, now, and the evolution in our financial model over that six and a half years has simply been remarkable, uh, actually head spinning, in fact, and so we've seen extraordinarily rapid change over a very short length of time. And I would say from the public policy point of view, ha, ha, our policy is not caught up to the reality of our of, of finances. And so let me sort of talk a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, when, <coughs> of course, we, uh, like all universities like ourselves, like the entire U UC system, describe ourselves as a state uh, university. Uh, uh, and uh, six and a half years ago, uh, when I came here as chancellor at that time, the hierarchy of our funding was that the largest single source of funding for the university was the state, and specifically funds that the state provided to operate Berkeley. Uh, the second was federal funding for research. Third was student fees. Uh, fourth, uh, about, so the numbers are the state funding then was, let's say, 450 million. Federal research funding was probably about 300 million, 350 million. Uh, student fees generated about 150 million. Philanthropy was slightly less, and endowment income was 
100 to 120 million. So we go from state funding at the, let's say, for operations at the $450 million level, some state money for research, which the state likes to regard as funding, but since they don't provide adequate overhead, we actually lose money on all of the state research funding. Uh, we don't lose money. We, we come at least close to breaking even on federal funding. So that's what you would hope for uh, in, in, a, in a public university, state public university, which is the state would be the predominant source of funding, and you would hope that student fees would be relatively far down in the hierarchy of our funding. So uh, as a result of the governor's uh, announcement uh, of a minimum of a $500 million cut to the UC budget uh, coming uh, next July 1, which if the referendum uh, that he has proposed either doesn't get on the ballot or does get on the ballot and doesn't pass, uh, that number will go up significantly. And I'm sure King, who's very eloquent on this, will be able to tell you over lunch <laughs> in some detail what the consequences will be for the Cal State system. If you now look at our funding uh, uh, hierarchy, then now at Cal, the largest source of funding is the federal government for research. So in some ways, we've transitioned from being a state to a federal university, and I'll talk some more about that. In the same way that MIT, which I spent 25 years uh, at, is called the private university. Actually, it's a federal university, um, more correctly. Uh, so uh, federal funding for research uh, and this boom uh, with the national competitiveness uh, has increased the federal funding, on-campus funding, including some money that comes through Lawrence Berkeley Lab. That's now up to $500 million a year from the federal government. That's a lot of money, actually. Uh, and uh, because of that, our research enterprise is actually flourishing. And so that aspect of Berkeley is going, is going very well. Uh, second in the hierarchy, so federal funding is number one. Second in the hierarchy is now student fees. And this is in a system which had promised zero fees uh, at, when the master plan was first uh, constructed. So, so uh, student fees are the second most important. This year, funding from student fees is $315 million. Uh, and with the uh, program fee increase, that will go up to $340 million. The third most important source of support for us is private philanthropy. And so private philanthropy uh, is, this year, is approximately the same as student fee income. Uh, so we have federal funding at $500 million. Uh, this year, um, uh, student fee uh, income is 315 and philanthropy is just about the same, which is a good news story in a way, right? Then fourth in a hierarchy, and essentially last, is the state. And so the state funding uh, this year, these numbers are a little bit squishy. Uh, uh, are uh, somewhat above 300. Uh, it depends what you count. Next year, and this is a really important thing, uh, will be 280 million. And that's if the referendum passes. Okay. So, so uh, that means that uh, we've gone from a state supported university to a largely state located university uh, in a remarkably short length of time. And we have not been, we, are trying madly to adjust in real time. So, uh, and of course, when I talked to Mary Sue Coleman, the president of Michigan, you know, she just looks at me and said, well, sort of welcome to the club, <laughs> right? So, uh, so, so uh, this is not new. We just didn't expect it to happen in California where higher education, where the population traditionally seemed to have understood the critical role of higher education in the, in the health of the state, but uh, it has happened. So. Uh, this change in the hierarchy has a lot of implications for the university, and we're just dealing with these in, in real time. Uh, you know, a very interesting policy question, which I would be working on if I was a policy person and knew something about policy rather than being a condensed matter of physics interested in the role of quantum mechanics and the macroscopic behavior of some odd materials. Uh, so if I was a policy person, I would probably raise the question of uh, what does it mean I mean, how much control should the state have over our ability to make important decisions if they only provide 15% of our budget or less? I think that's a very interesting question. Of how much autonomy should individual campuses have if the state is a minor player in our financial model? Uh, and what are the constitutional implications of that? I think it's a, it's a subject 
which, uh, if the financial trend continues, I think public policy people ought to start, uh, ought to start addressing. I'm going to, in the end, uh, mention an idea which actually Bob, in his former life, uh, we presented to him in Washington of, of uh, one of the ways in which I think things should evolve. Uh, it happens uh, that, that uh, one of the largest challenges, obviously, for us <coughs> is uh, with diminishing support from the state government, how do we maintain our public character? How do we maintain what makes Berkeley a very special place that you know, attracts many of us, myself included, to come here to, to work and to uh, uh, pursue our, our lives? Um, before discussing that, let me mention one of the evolutions which is happening in real time at Berkeley and which has gone very far at Michigan and Virginia, uh, which is that, of course, uh, it, it had been assumed in the past that our primary, one of the issues that has to be on the table is it was assumed in the past that our primary responsibility is to, uh, is to educate Californians. We still believe that that is true. But at some stage, if the state is, the state is now supporting about half of our, Cali a little more than half of our California residents, or they will next year, uh, and only half, uh, or slightly more than half. Um, so if the state is not contributing a dime for close to half of our California residents, what are our obligations to the state? I think that's a policy question which gets raised. Uh, secondly, uh, what should the balance, then a corollary of that is, what should the balance be of in-state and out-of-state uh, students in our university? Uh, Berkeley is in the favored position that we can have as many extraordinarily talented out-of-state and international students as we want. Uh, we had been uh, well before the uh, financial, recent financial challenges hit us, uh, been trying to increase the number of out-of-state and, and international students in the classroom for educational reasons. Uh, and I give a vignette which has the uh, uh, nice feature that it's actually true, uh, which is that we have an event uh, in which we, uh, at the house, my house, uh, in which we welcome the incoming students. And so last uh, August, I was standing talking to a uh, group of three young uh, incoming freshmen who were Californians, native Californians, and we were discussing the economic crisis in California and its impact on the university. And at that point, a fourth freshman joined us, listened for a few minutes, and he said, well, he said, uh, I'm a new freshman who just came from Greece, and I can tell you, you don't know anything about economic crises. <laughs> so, and, and, I, and in fact, uh, you know, that's, that is, uh, 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 you know, illustrative of, of uh, the benefits of having out-of-state and international students. A second example, uh, which is, happens to be my favorite as someone who has lived in for various lengths of time in Canada a lot, in Denmark and in England, States with uh, countries with outstanding healthcare systems uh, and with very uh, low mortality rates, et cetera. Uh, when I listen to the healthcare debates uh, and continue to, I go crazy basically because of the misrepresentation of well functioning healthcare systems. Uh, just the advantage of having someone in the classroom who's actually you know, benefited from a, a, a well functioning healthcare system, uh, you, you can't underestimate that. So let me now uh, go quickly. Uh, one of the things that we take great pride in here at Cal and we will not sacrifice is our incredible accessibility. 37% uh, of our undergraduate students are on federal Pell Grants. Uh, that's more than all eight Ivy League universities plus MIT plus Stanford combined. I mean, so that's, so whenever people ask me, what do you mean you're a public institution, I always quote that statistic. So we are the conduit into mainstream society of an extraordinarily large number of very talented people from young people from very disadvantaged backgrounds. And we can take great pride in that. That is possible financially only because of the combination of federal Pell Grants, Cal Grants, which the state has stayed loyal to. So to be fair to the state, they have continued to fully fund Cal Grants. Uh, the governor has some trick, which is making us very worried about the continued stability of and how Cal Grants are funded, so we're very worried about that. Uh, another good public policy issue. Uh, and of our $315 million in fees this year, we return $85 million. We give $85 million back to low-income students. Uh, and we will not compromise that here at Berkeley. There's a huge amount of pressure to reduce that number. And we're absolutely committed to supporting our low-income students at the level that they have been. 
Uh, our students here in the UC system generally, and at Berkeley in particular, uh, in spite of what you read in the media, actually, uh, in terms of the country as a whole, our low-income students graduate with the lowest debts of any public universities in the United States. Uh, you often hear the very different information, but it's not correct. Okay. And that's because of our robust financial aid systems. Um, clearly, in going forward, uh, 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 oh, I should have mentioned as an aside, and it's another public policy issue, uh, our financial aid system has very successfully guaranteed continued accessibility with low debt and low, actually, after-school workloads for low-income students. But there's an incredible challenge for the middle-income families who, of course, dominate the voters. And that's an unsolved problem. So I don't have a glib solution for how we address the issues of, of financial support of kids, for, young people from middle-income families. Um, so that's something we're working on very hard. Uh, just as a, an aside to extend our financial aid uh, system, which cuts off at 80 million, approximately 80,000, up to a family income of 120,000, turns out would require us to spend another $50 million out of our operating budget on financial aid. So it's large numbers. So let me now finish up. Uh, clearly, we cannot continue to have to deal with successive $80 million budget cuts just for Berkeley alone year after year. I mean, uh, it's, it's too large a swing to be able to respond to in one year. We're uh, in, in, in the throes of some very complicated budget planning right now. Uh, to his credit, Governor Schwarzenegger last year recognized the importance of higher education and actually increased our funding. And we're very disappointed that the new governor has uh, not followed the example of his predecessor and instead has uh, proposed slashing higher education. Finally, and I've used up too much time already, so let me just say uh, that we are now one of the very few countries in the world uh, where the public universities have found themselves in the situation they're in where the federal government has not stepped in. Uh, and so the federal government stepped in in a major way in Canada, stepped up in a major way in Germany, uh, stepped up in a major way in Japan, obviously in China. Uh, and we, we, Frank Heary, my, my former Vice Chancellor for Administration, I have a very explicit plan for how the federal government uh, could help address the issues of the great public universities uh, in the country. Uh, and sooner or later, I believe that the federal government is going to have to recognize that the great public universities are, of course, state assets, but they're also national assets. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, back at my alma mater. I'm a Berkeley uh, MPP and PhD graduate from the Goldman School, which was then just GSPP, Graduate School of Public Policy, but uh, delighted to see it have, have a proper name. I'm currently a professor at the Daniel J. Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington. And uh, like Chancellor Bergenau, I could cite some very similar figures for our situation uh, where we've gone from four, at the University of Washington, we've gone from 400 million from the state roughly in uh, 2007 to 300 million in the current year and the proposal is 225 for next year in the governor's budget. And the Rubicon was crossed in this last year with the big cut from 400 to 300 where the tuition is now uh, substantially more than the state allocation. Yeah, and f fortunately we have a billion, t well, fortunately or unfortunately, we have a billion two in, uh, in research money, but uh, that doesn't pay for itself, as you, as you pointed out. Uh, okay, well I was asked to provide a national uh, perspective here, so that's what I'm gonna try to do. Uh, I'm gonna t talk a bit about long-term trends in higher education finance. This, what's happening now is deeper and, and, and all that, but it, you can see the roots <laughs> of it in longer-term <laughs> trends. Uh, there are cycl cyclical patterns that are very important within those, those trends. Look at the, uh, what's happened to tuition, uh, largely as a result of the uh, downward movement of state support. Uh, what the future holds, uh, fiscally speaking, as far as we can see. And then uh, if there's time, maybe uh, say a little bit about some possible s directions that could be picked up later in uh, conversation. Uh, so the long-term trends. 
So I uh, hope, can everyone see this pie chart? Okay, so we've got uh, the earliest year I could find easily was in 1995, but the same patterns would, would apply if you went back into the 80s. And the latest year I could find was 2009. The higher education slice is down here at the uh, southeast. Uh, it's the red uh, or reddish colored uh, uh, slice of the pie. Uh, it was at 12.9% of the state general funds across the 50 states in 1995. It's 115 in 2009. Uh, and if you went back to in the 1980s, maybe Dennis knows the answer, but it's probably uh, 13 or 14% uh, in those earlier years. So higher education is declining. Look at uh, elementary and secondary education is up a couple of points, two and a half uh, percentage points, and is by far the largest slice. Uh, Medicaid has gone up uh, rapidly past higher education in the early 90s, as I recall, in that recession. Public assistance is a lot lower than people think, uh, down from 4.4 to 1.9. Corrections only up marginally uh, nationally, uh, although we saw in the last panel a lot more in, uh, in, Calif in, uh, yeah, in California, up from just 6.7 to 7.2. Now this is another way of looking at uh, our, the, the, the nation's um, commitment to uh, funding higher education. This is a, a relationship, a ratio between uh, state support of operating budgets of, of universities per, uh, and, and there's also student aid is in there, per $1,000 of personal income on a very long term, uh, looking at a very long term trend here, what's that, 50 years or so back to 1961. And you see uh, quite a run up in the proportion of our wealth uh, that we were devoting to higher education in the 1970s, up at 10 and a half dollars per thousand. And then a pretty, pretty steady decline. I mean, there's some slight uh, blips where it goes back up a little bit, but generally quite a, a strong decline down to six point this isn't showing up very well here, 6.5 or so, 6.58 I think that is in, in fiscal 2009. So that's about a 38% decline in our commitment as a share of wealth to uh, higher education from, from uh, state funds. And this shows that same ratio, uh, which actually shows the change in fiscal support per thousand. In other words, the amount of decline from 1980 to 2010, so that's over a 30-year period. And the only state that has an increase, marginal increase, is North Dakota. And every other state has, is de devoting less, most of them by a very large percentage, to uh, higher education than they were before. As I said, the national figure is 38 or so. California is the red bar over there, one of the worst, uh, 40, or cl in the lower dozen or so, 47 or 48 percent decline over that 30 year period in the uh, share of wealth going to operating expenses of higher education. Uh, so, and, and I should say a little bit about, uh, go back to that pie chart, think about what's going on there. Other parts of the state budget are uh, growing as uh, higher education uh, declines and you wonder, so why is that? Do we care more about Medicaid and prisons and all the rest than we do about higher education. Well, think, or K-12 education, think they, there has been a commitment since uh, the early 1980s uh, to, to, to try to figure out what we can do to improve elementary and secondary education. So a great deal of, of uh, money has been put into that. And uh, so that's the reason that you see some increase there. Uh, corrections, we heard in the previous panel about the um, of determinant sentences and three strikes you're out, that's not unique to California. You see that around the country. Uh, and then the big, the big item and the econometrics that's been done on this makes it very clear that what's really driving the, the, the squeeze on, on uh, higher education is uh, healthcare expenditures. So healthcare goes up at a rate of inflation uh, that's far greater than the general rate of inflation. And uh, the population's aging, so that the, the kinds of expenditures for uh, Medicaid and even for state employees and, and other things that states pay for in healthcare is going up at a much more rapid rate than uh, general inflation or than state revenues. So you have the, the, pieces, the other pieces of the pie with, with kind of inexorable 
uh, forces behind them, and the overall size of the pie is not allowed to grow. Uh, we have 25 states with some form of tax or expenditure limitation built into law, and the other half have politics that, that drives, we, we know, I'm sure everyone in the audience is familiar with the general pattern of anti-tax politics that we've seen since about this time. So all of that is, is, is pushing in that direction. And how does, structurally, how does higher education work in the budget compared to these other things? Well, higher education is, is uh, essentially what, what's called in budget parlance uh, discretionary. You don't have to fund higher education caseloads. You do have, by law uh, or, or something close to it, you have to fund the caseload in corrections. You have to fund the caseload in the, the kids who come to the schoolhouse door. You have to fund by federal law, you have to fund uh, Medicaid, uh, uh, el people who are eligible for Medicaid. It's a federal state partnership deal. You don't get the federal money if you don't follow the rules. You have to uh, enroll eligible people and put state money into that. Higher education is, the, is all often called the balance wheel of the state budget. Uh, when, it, when things are tough, and I'll get to these cyclical patterns in a minute, uh, and, and a lot of that's driven by business cycles, when things are tough, then, uh, then uh, higher education tends to be the thing that gets, that gets hit hardest. But there are these more underlying patterns in the structure of state budgets before we get to the cyclical, and that's what I was trying to illustrate there. Now this, um, is a chart that's a little complicated, but let me help you through it. Uh, what the, the line up there is represents uh, enrollment, FT, full-time equivalent enrollment uh, in high, uh, public higher education over the period from 1984. And the blue lines are <coughs> constant dollar expenditures per FTE student provided by state appropriations. Okay, that's the blue bars. So there's a couple of things I want to show you about that. Uh, 1984 figure is, uh, I'm reading that as 6621 in uh, 2009 dollars. And you see some ups and downs, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you get over here to 2009. Bob, can you read that? 6928. 69, so we're pretty much where we were in the mid 80s in terms of constant dollar expenditures per student. So that's one point. Another point, uh, maybe even more important, well, that, that's a very important point, but another point is that uh, we have a powerful cyclical forces at work here. So remember the early 80s, some of us will remember the early 80s, there was a big recession, big deep recession in the early 80s, and uh, the, the country was just coming out of that recession by the, the first year shown in this chart. And so you're at, uh, you see a nice run-up, which tends to, uh, historically has tended to happen in periods, periods of prosperity, especially if they last a long time. Eventually, legislatures get around to putting money back into higher education. It does pretty well for a while. So we see real expenditures go up and peak at 78.92 in 1987, if I'm reading that right. And then we hit another uh, recession in the early 90s, and you see the state contributions dropping down back into the 6,000s, 6824, looks like the low point in 1993. And so what's happening up in the green bars, that's tuition per student, and it's, it's net tuition, net of state contributions to student aid. So uh, we see that increasing, in the, particularly in the periods when uh, state appropriations are going down. But in, in general, if we could look at the tuition alone, we'd see that tuition is, is also going up. It was 2147 in the first year, 1984, and it's up to, by this 1993, it's up to 3043. Okay, so the state funding is, is declining uh, if you compare those two years, and the tuition share is increasing pretty rapidly. And then you can follow that through the, the uh, prosper period of prosperity in the late 90s. Uh, the tuition bars, you'll notice, flatten out a bit. They don't get bigger very fast. Uh, these are constant dollars uh, but in, in those good years. But they don't drop either. So tuition continues to go up at rates greater than uh, general inflation or greater than the growth in people's personal incomes on a median or average basis. And then we hit the, the dot-com recession in the early 2000s, and we see it, another sharp dip. Appropriations drop back to 66, 6, 65, 73 in 2005, I think that is. That was the low point. 
uh, quite a sharp drop, sharper than the previous recession. And you see the, the green bars are getting extended, right? But the green bars don't go up enough to offset the, the big budget cuts so that you see a drop in the overall spending uh, from these two main sources of revenue for public institutions uh, from a, a qu quite a substantial drop. Uh, these numbers aren't totaled, but you can see a substantial drop there uh, in that early 2000s recession. Then you see another run up in the late, in the period of prosperity between the two recessions of the last decade. And in 2009, then you see the first signs, which will show up in, in later data, of course, uh, of, of another drop in state appropriations and a big increase in tuition again. Meanwhile, uh, if you followed the, the, the bars, the, um, the trend line for the enrollments, the tuition goes up at just the time when, uh, and, and uh, just the time when students want to go to school. In other words, when you have a recession, the labor market's slack. That makes, it makes sense for many people to turn to improve their human capital by going back to school. And that's just when tuition is going up most rapidly. So it's quite a perverse set of funding arrangements that we have here that don't make a lot of broad policy sense. Uh, so this one just shows the, uh, it's in another way, shows the relationship between when tuition spikes uh, and, and how that responds to um, the appropriations decline. So the, when the, it's the blue line is the, appropriation, the percent change from year to year in state appropriations to, to uh, per full-time student in public four-year institutions in constant dollars. Uh, and, the, and then the uh, yellowish uh, bars are the tuition spikes. So you see when the blue, the blue goes down, the, the, uh, the yellow goes up quite sharply. So tuition is sort of the, fills in the gaps. And the state, the state tends to, the, the legislators in most states will kind of say, well, uh, let's look across the different pieces of the pie that we can cut. And remember that a lot of those other pieces, like Medicaid and criminal justice and so on, welfare certainly, are going up. The demand for that is going up during a uh, recession period. Uh, and so we've got, sort of got to fund those caseloads, and they're going up. And what can we avoid? Well, we can, where can we cut? Well, we don't have to enroll more students, even though more want to get in. Uh, or we can simply tell the, the higher education people to uh, charge the customers more. And you can't do that with the customers in corrections or Medicaid or welfare, right? So, or or K-12 education. So that's where the cuts come. So uh, implications of these tuition trends. Well, now here's a broader take on uh, how we're financing higher education. Uh, this breaks it down, the major sources, by state and local government, local counts because of the community college funding in many states from local sources. Uh, the red is, that's the blue, the red is students and families, and the yellow is the federal government. So the federal share is pretty steady at 10% over many, many, many years. And the state and local share is, uh, has dropped from 60% uh, or so of the total f f funding for higher education uh, to 40% as of 2008. And of course, it's going to be, have dropped a lot more uh, once we get the data for the next few years after that. And the, state, uh, the student and family share is way up from 30 to 50% over that period. And that, that red line will be turning back up, of course, in 2009, 2010, 2011, and way into the future, I'm afraid. Uh, so what, what does this do? This, uh, th th so, so this covers a shorter period, but it gives you an idea. What happens when you raise tuition this sharply? Uh, it means that tuition uh, grows much more rapidly than people's incomes. This covers the dec eight years or so from 99, 2000 to 2007, 08. And it shows, the upper panel shows you public four-year colleges and universities. Tu net college costs. Tuition, room and board minus financial aid as a percentage of median family income over that period of time. And you see that in every f income quintile, let's just look at the upper panel for now, uh, the, uh, in every uh, quintile of, of the income distribution, the share of college, college costs as a share of personal income has increased. But in which income quintiles has it increased the most? This is after financial aid is taken into account. 
the lowest income quintile, up 16 points as a share of income. Now, income isn't going up much. 16 points is a heck of an increase in eight years. Lower middle income quintile, up 10 points. Middle income quintile, seven points. Upper middle income quintile, four points. Highest income quintile, three points. Big, big uh, pattern of, of uh, unfortunate, inequitable pattern there that, that comes out of all of these structural forces. Nobody's really trying to do this, but that's where we're ending up. And the public two-year colleges, which are designed to be particularly responsive to the lowest income folks, uh, are, you, you see a, it's a little better, but it's still terrible. The lowest income quintile is up from 40 to 49 percent. Uh, middle income quintile up from 22 to 29 percent of income required to pay college costs. So what does the future hold? Are things going to get any better? Well, this is a projection uh, courtesy of Dennis Jones, by the way. Uh, this is a projection of state and local uh, budget surplus or gap, and the, the downward uh, direction of the lines means it's a gap. These are structural budget deficits projected out as far as we can see with current data, assuming tax rates stay the same, and that uh, caseload using standard caseload projections that are based on data that are available across uh, f all 50 states. So individual data for California, for example, might be a bit different. Uh, California is the green line, and the U.S. is the red line here, or bar. Uh, all 50, the, sh the short answer is all 50 states project, are projected to have structural budget deficits out to 2016. And uh, the U.S. figure, if you, add this, you aggregate this, it's minus 6% uh, of revenues. And uh, if the California figure is about minus 4, maybe California, and this was done before the recession, really. Dennis was, this was based on data through about 2007. Yeah. Okay, so uh, th this is all pre-recession data. It's got to look worse now. So this is not a happy prospect, right? Uh, this is a long way into the future. This, the, the kind of uh, near devastating cuts, uh, won't quite use that word, but, but dr drastic uh, reductions in state funding for higher education that we've seen in recent years uh, are not likely to turn around very, very fast. And uh, they're not like the, what we see as a recovery is, is uh, not likely to return us to where we were before. In other words, the chancellor isn't going to have, or my institution is not going to have back its 400 million from the state probably ever. It's, this is a new world of financing higher education. So um, is there anything we can just, is there anything we can say, let, let me just throw out a couple of ideas about how one might begin to think about the future, and I'm sure the other panelists will have things to say about this. Uh, the president's degree goals, the president has set uh, a goal of, of uh, generating, uh, bringing us by 2020 to the, back to the position of leading the world in college degree attainment as a share of the uh, young population, as a share of the total working age population, I believe it is. As b by 2020. Now that could mean modest federal help. The chancellor referred to federal uh, involvement in higher education, which is low in this country. It could mean modest federal help uh, if the economy recovered and the president were reelected, which is uh, probably highly correlated. Those two, those two. But it would likely be any federal help would likely be tied. Uh, would work through student aid. As, as it has been our tradition in this country, it would be a big change to direct uh, federal funds to institutions and then how would you decide which ones and so on. And it would likely be tied to some, uh, 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 some tuition restraint, some uh, guarantees about tuition restraint. Uh, we could look to creative approaches to student aid at the state and institutional levels that, that do better at driving aid to those who need it and uh, less to those who don't need the aid. Uh, we've had a pattern in this country uh, in recent years of more and more of aid not going to students on the basis of, although the aid is more needed because of the tuition situation, uh, more and more of the aid pot is going, being driven out by on what's called academic merit rather than uh, on the basis of financial need. 
Uh, there are possibilities, uh, quite a few, for smart reductions in the cost of producing these degrees that the president wants to produce. Uh, these are definitely possible, but will probably require a sense of crisis. Maybe this long-term pattern uh, will generate, and a sense that it's not going away, uh, will begin to generate that sense of crisis at some point. And it's not just a, meaning it's not just a matter of waiting out the latest recession. We're going to have to use tech, uh, systemically now. We're going to have to use technology uh, a lot more, uh, instructional technology and smart ar rearrangements of the use of faculty time as uh, integrated with technology. And we're going to have to think more about assessing people's learning and competencies uh, independent, in, in, in part independent of what they do in classrooms so that people can get to degrees and certifications more with less expenditure of classroom time. There's likely to be, as Bob Shireman knows well, uh, a f the for-profit sector of higher education has grown very rapidly in this country, and it's inevitably going to be part of this, but it's got to be properly regulated, and he's made a big contribution to that. We have to do more serious work uh, with our, our collaborative work with our partners in education at the K-12 and community college levels. I'm teaching a course about this that I just developed uh, r during this present term to ensure that fewer students, way too many fall in the cracks in the system, don't make it from secondary to higher education or don't make it from the community colleges. We have a big community college system in Washington similar to what you have here. Not enough students transfer successfully. Uh, and it's, it's arguable that both business and individual taxpayers might be willing to reinvest in higher education if they, uh, and, and in, in the education system generally, including this connection with K-12, uh, if they saw the system as more efficient and accountable and better aligned with public goals. So uh, I think uh, Dennis will likely want to pick up on some of that. For those of you in the audience that knows me, this is uh, a rare occasion. I'm going to talk without pictures. Uh, I very seldom do this. Uh, I've got a very short time, so I'm just going to make statements pretty much in the form of a few bullet points. And that means I'm going to be blunt and therefore probably impolitic about a couple of things. Uh, but let me just say, a couple of things and, and make about six points here. First of all, the conversation that we're really having is, is really being misspecified. It's being talked about as an exercise in balancing the budget and it's treated as a finance issue. Bob Sharman made the point that it has to be framed as an issue about the future of California and its role in the world and the global economy. Uh, the question is not how do you balance the budget, it is how do you improve education attainment to levels that ensure global competitiveness under conditions of fiscal constraint. That's a very different question than balancing the budget. And if, if California is to do its share to meet the President's goal that, that Bill just mentioned, California is going to have to graduate 5% more students in its higher education system every year between now and 2025. 5% year over year increases in degree production. Second, this conversation is being viewed and, and framed as a short term issue. How do you deal with the 2012 fiscal? situation, it's not a short-term issue. I can't find any economists that deal with state fiscal policy that say that we're going to get out of the current fiscal mess for higher education in less than five years, and many of them are saying, think 2020. So what you see next year is what you're going to see the year after is what you're going to see the year after unless something dramatic changes. But current fiscal policy will lead to a, a continuing downward spiral. And 
you know, I hear Washington talk about its problems. I hear California talk about its problems. I'm from Colorado. Let me tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, in Colorado, system-wide, for all of public higher education, the students are now putting in 76% of the cost of higher education. Okay? Last year, the state put in 870, there about million to higher ed. This year, it's 600 million. Senate Majority Leaders and I had a little conversation. He said, think about it as 300 million next year for the whole enterprise. Point two, we're talking about this in terms that isolate higher education fiscal policy as about funding the segments in California, about funding UC, CSU, about the community colleges. It's not. Sound fiscal policy has to deal simultaneously with funding the institutions and with tuition and with student financial aid. All of the money has to be on the table at once and you have to craft policy that thinks about all pieces simultaneously. And point three is a direct correlate of that. California does not have the venue for talking about either state goals or about developing the fiscal policy that covers the three elements of appropriation, student financial aid, and tuition. Every fiscal policy in higher education is a separate train on its own track. UC sets its own tuition, the legislature sets student financial aid policy, Cal Grant policy, and somewhere in there, you know, the legislature also, but in a very different format, makes decisions about appropriations to institutions. They're done on different time cycles, they're done in different ways. Point four, the segments are starting from very different places and have very different abilities to cope with the fiscal situation that they're facing. You can talk about the, the problems facing UC, but the reality is that University of California, as the Chancellor noted, has a lot more tools and, and a lot more arrows in its quiver than the community college system, okay? I mean, the community college system doesn't have much by way of endowment income, doesn't have much in the way of research income, uh, and it, I mean, the, the, the options for dealing with this problem are much greater at the University of California system than they are elsewhere in California higher education. And the reality is that the University of California system, the enterprise, the segment, it's about in the middle uh, nationally for, for research universities as far as funding per student. To put it in perspective, the University of Colorado at Boulder has one half the money per student the University of California at Berkeley. Berkeley's got about somewhere around 20,000 in general operating funds per student. Boulder has about 10. So there are institutions that are doing a pretty good job, by the way. Boulder is not a bad place uh, with a lot less money than Berkeley is, is living with. CSU is in about the same place as comparable institutions. The reality is that the community colleges in California are poorly funded by any comparison. Any approach to dealing with higher ed policy in California, funding and otherwise, has got to start, not stop, with a conversation about funding the community college system in this state. And one of the problems as an outsider that I see over and over again, you can talk about higher education and it's about UC and CSU. I sat in front about two years ago of a joint meeting of the legislative caucuses, the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and they spent more time talking about the 200 of their constituents that were not going to get into Berkeley than they did about the 200,000 of their constituents that were not going to get into the community college system. 
So the, the issue of what is really higher ed policy in the state is heavily skewed toward the elite institutions, not toward the institutions that are really going to have to do the heavy lifting. Final thing that I will say, well, point five. There are decisions to be made by th all three parties to this. First of all, students. And there are some actions that the students are going to have to take. And that action is they're going to have to pay more tuition. And I'm going to explicitly say at the community colleges. Community college students pay about a quarter of what tuition is average in the rest of the country. If there is one place to put more money into the higher ed system in California, it's through community college tuition, and you can do it because the students themselves won't pay. Pell and its tuition tax credits will pick up practically every nickel. The state of California is, you know, and Bob Sharman knows this better than I, the state of California is leaving absolutely boatloads of federal money on the table by virtue of its very low tuition policy, particularly in the community colleges, and CU is, CSU is low as well. Tuition is so low at the community colleges that the marginal revenue can't cover the marginal cost of putting a part-time faculty member in the classroom. So the solution is, let's leave students out rather than let's accommodate them. State's going to have to do some things, one of which, and we could have an interesting conversation, but one of them, I would argue, is to, in a much more structured way, assume responsibility for all need-based student financial aid within a framework that focuses attention on the linkage between student and financial aid policy. And I know California just hates to get an idea from any place else. In fact, uh, there's never an idea any place else that you could bring across the border for any reason. Uh, but if you were to look directly to your north uh, in Oregon, they have a student financial aid policy that is statewide policy that is very worth taking a look at uh, because uh, it, it structures it in a way that makes the state dollar the last dollar in, but it does it also in such a way that it links tuition and student financial aid policy uh, in, in a very effective way. Um, and if that were to happen, by the way, it would free up part at least of that 85 million that the chancellor talked about uh, coming out of his own pocket to fund student financial aid to be used for other purposes. And that trade-off, I think, is an important consideration. Second thing that the state has to do is change its budgeting practice, particularly, again, in the community college, so that the money that the students raise in tuition actually stays on the campus instead of going back to the state treasury. And finally, and probably most seriously, the state has to undertake really serious regulatory reform. I, I've taken a look at the community college, again, part of that. This state has the most onerous, impossible set of regulations on institutions of any state in the U.S. So even if you had money, you couldn't spend it the way you wanted to. And finally, institutions are going to have to do something. They can't put money on the table, but they are going to have to shift their thinking away from access to success and away from budgeting to productivity. And a whole conversation about how we get more with the money we have it has to be part of the conversation. That's on the, on the four-year institution side, because you have very effective institutions for various reasons. You get a lot of your students through to the end. There have to be more and continuing conversations about efficiency. At the two-year institution level, it has to be how do you keep 
such a huge proportion of the students from never finishing anything. Final point, and California is going to somehow have to get past its policy-making gridlock. There are lots of thoughtful people in this room and in this state, and there are friends from out of the state, and I put Bill Zometa and myself in that category, who could pretty quickly lay out an action agenda for how do you solve some of the fiscal issues facing higher education in this state. But having worked in and around the state for a lot of years, I'm also very pessimistic about your ability to implement any of those ideas. <laughs> Unless a way out of the gridlock can, can be reached. Uh, and, and these are things that you have to tackle. I mean, you can't wait for whole new legislature. You can't wait for all of those things. Six years, eight years from now, maybe it well be too late. The only way that I, can th that I can think of to get through this particular quagmire is to establish the equivalent of a base realignment and closure commission that established, committed to by the governor and the legislature, turned over to some folks and say, make a series of recommendations about a variety of things, including the goals to be addressed, long-term fiscal policy that addresses tuition, student financial aid appropriations, specifies changes in the regulatory environment, recommends some device to keep it going, and put it in front of the legislature and say, you have to vote on the whole package, up or down. Same way that the government did when it closed military bases. I don't think that there's a way to get at this piecemeal and a little bit at a time. And California is going to be, you know, as an outsider, I've spent a lot of time working in other states. This state has less capacity to deal than any of the other states that I work in. I mean, we talk about Illinois, some other states that have the same big problems that this state does. But the legislature, the governor, can sit down and, in fact, raise taxes uh, and got it done in about two months. Not going to happen here. Uh, so end of, end of spiel. Thank you. So how y'all doing? <laughs> Feeling good? Upbeat? This is California. This is the Golden State. We're not going to put up with this kind of nonsense. Um, let me begin with uh, an apology and a promise. The apology is that we're feeling so lousy at this moment, based upon good and solid information. Uh, the promise is that if you'll stick with me for about 10 minutes, I hope to be able to say one or two encouraging things, to lift your spirits before lunch. Uh, we're very much focused on cuts, particularly in higher education for purposes of this panel. And the dominant view of these cuts among members of the public in California is that higher education is the one function of state government that they think works well. From the public perspective, the only issue is whether student access to public higher education remains, quote, affordable. Uh, the dominant view of these cuts, as best I can tell from, uh, from the perspective of faculty and staff on campuses, is that, one, times are tough, but the funding cuts are temporary. Two, there's no need to change anything important or fundamental as to how our colleges and universities function. Just wait until the good times roll again. And three, it would help enormously to dial up the positive PR and political lobbying on behalf of higher education. I'm here to argue that every aspect of these prevailing public and campus views is wrong. And you've already heard 
a good deal about why they're wrong. California public higher education has entered an era of financial limitations, severe financial limitations at the very time that our state economy requires an ever larger number of people to have post-secondary education and preparation. In the latter half of the last century, remember the last century? California found it easy to import all of the college-educated folks we needed for our economy. At the same time, we were wise enough to build a public higher education system that would enable us to be self-sufficient in terms of educating an a, a effective and competitive workforce. Now it's far more difficult to import college-educated folks into California, and the system we built is currently unable to deliver the educated citizenry that we need. The public, the government, and the institutions of higher education themselves have only begun to realize the full import of these problems, and we've just started a serious discussion of the difficult changes that are required, as my fellow panelists have said. Let's begin with the public perception that all is well in California higher education other than rising tuition levels. Couple of facts. California is 40th in the nation in the rate of high school graduates going directly to college. We are 47th in the number of degrees and certificates awarded in relation to enrollment. We are falling precipitously in the ranking of the, pop, the percent of the population with college degrees as we are failing to educate young people to the same level as older generations who are beginning to retire. And across all measures of student performance, completion, and success, we have serious racial and ethnic gaps. The Public Policy Institute of California projects that within the next 15 years, and Dennis made specific reference to this, the California workforce will demand a million more baccalaureate degree holders than we are currently producing. And that says nothing about the demand for two-year graduates. So I don't think you need any more to convince you we've got problems. Neither the federal or the state government will be riding to our rescue. Uh, You've seen a lot about what the state situation is. I won't gild that lily, uh, except to add just one or two things. We have enormous unfunded liabilities in California for employee retirement and health benefits at both state and local levels. Legislative analyst says maybe in the order of $200 billion. Other folks will come up with other numbers, but th the numbers are very large. And as you have seen, the pressure for medical care, for prisons, for K-12 education will keep the proportion of the state budget going to higher education going down. It will not go up. There are many supporters of higher taxes within our colleges and universities. I suspect in this room, many of you say, let's increase taxes. The fact is we're going to be very lucky if the voters approve a continuation of the temporary tax increases. We'll be lucky if it gets on the ballot. We'll be lucky if it passes. But I'm, I'm reasonably confident about that. The most we could hope for in the longer term is a preservation of those temporary taxes so they don't lapse in another five years. So we're basic, if we can keep at the current level of tax burden in California, we're going to be lucky, much less increasing. What about the federal government? One of the reasons state taxes are not going to go up is because federal taxes have to go up. Anybody who's looked at the reports of the two national commissions in December about our national debt knows we face enormous problems in having both to cut federal spending across the board, Medicare, Social Security, defense, and increase taxes. And Chancellor, I like the idea of the federal government riding to the rescue of research universities, but it ain't going to happen. We, we can hope that the Republicans don't succeed in cutting Pell Grants now, much less increase. So we are in a new and much less generous era, and it, the era is not going to be a short one. And this is hard for us to accept because in California for the last half of the last century, things were good. 
Clark Kerr said the golden era of the University of California was 1940 to 1990. He might have made the same statement about the state of California. So we're in a new area in which a lot of things which seemed right and maybe were right for an earlier period have to be re-examined, and that's not easy. So question, are we making the wisest use of the revenues that public higher education already has? Uh, this conversation could go on for a long time, but let's just talk for a minute or two about the community colleges, because Dennis has introduced them and has rightly said, look at folks, if you want a more successful system of higher education in California, you've got to look to the community colleges, because that's where the enormously larger portion of young people, particularly minority and poor kids, go to get their, their start in college. Only 31% of entering community college students achieve transfer to a four-year institution or complete a career technical certificate or an associate degree within six years after enrolling at a two-year two -year college. 31%. That means almost 70% drop out. They're still going, but they haven't gotten there yet. This is an enormous problem. Now let me be clear, community colleges are America's great contribution to higher education in the world, and California has the biggest such system. I formerly served on the Board of Governors. I, I admire the people who serve in our community colleges. They are wonderful people. But there are flaws in the system. Let me just enumerate a few of them. California community colleges do not insist that students be assessed upon entrance in terms of their learning problems and directed into the courses they need to achieve their educational goals. State law says that people over the age of 18 who can, quote, benefit from instruction are to be admitted to the community college. You don't need to be a high school graduate. But we've never defined what it means to benefit from instruction. And so the community colleges carry an enormous remedial education burden, which arguably they can't continue to carry, at least at the level that they are now. Course prerequisites for courses in the community colleges are often ignored. Now you, they, the catalog says you have to take that, but no, you just sign up. There are no requirements for making adequate academic progress once you've started. Even for the 50% of the community college students who are exempted from paying tuition. California is an exception to what Bill was saying before about the burden of community college tuition. We have by far the lowest community college tuition in the United States, and the poorest 50% get waivers so they don't have to pay any tuition whatsoever. And as Dennis pointed out, that lack of income makes California community colleges much less well-funded than colleges, comparable colleges in other states. The colleges receive, that is the community colleges receive the bulk of their funding from the state, and those allocations are based on enrollment, student enrollment in the third week of the semester. Colleges suffer no loss of income if students drop out immediately thereafter. Are we surprised that student persistence is not a top priority for the colleges? Let me just give you one more concrete example of a lack of priorities. And Again, I'm not, I don't want to slam the community colleges. I'm not pointing my finger at any specific individual. These are problems that we collectively have not addressed. 60 semester units are required to transfer from a community college to a four-year institution or to obtain an associate's degree. Career and technical programs typically require less than 60 units. But many students wind up taking more than 100 units. 40 more units than are needed for any recognized educational objective. As a result, many students, those students, are taking a disproportionate amount of college resources, including faculty time, at the very same time that many entering students from high schools can't get the courses they need to get started. This is, doesn't seem right priority. The legislative analyst, not the colleges, the legislative analyst has now proposed that the taxpayer subsidy be limited to the first 100 units. That is, you can take more if you want to, but you're going to pay the full freight. First 100 units, taxpayer continues to pay. This one straightforward common sense change 
would redirect $200 million a year to the benefit of students who have not yet taken those first 100 units. Are we going to be able to do it? I am very dubious. At the University of California, uh, as we know, student tuition has skyrocketed to make up for the drop in state funding. But even with that, the university is by no means out of the woods. Uh, we know that if the voters don't approve the temporary taxes, more cuts will be imposed. And the university has its own large financial overhang of unfunded retirement, pension, and health care costs. The university this year is asking the state of California to pay $200 million into the UC retirement system to help overcome this problem. I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell that's going to happen. The, uh, clearly, the historic policy of low tuition has been reversed. Uh, some cuts have been made in the UC pension system, but we're not there yet. And there is a determined effort, led in large measure by our good chancellor, to cut administrative expenses. And the Commission on the Future of the University says those administrative savings could add up to $500 million a year if they're pursued aggressively on all campuses over a period of years. But that undoubtedly will not be sufficient either. The university must get smaller. Whose interests will be served as that process goes on? Will historic centers of excellence such as Berkeley be protected? or newer campuses such as Merced? Will the interests of retirees be protected at the price of reducing educational opportunities for students? Will graduate enrollments be maintained or even increased, as the Academic Senate would like to see, at the cost of deeper restrictions on undergraduate education? These are all very tough problems. And we've only seen the beginning of experience with new technologies impact on instruction and the possibility that the University of California, and particularly this campus, can benefit from the global explosion in the interest in, of higher education and creating new universities. Now, in addition to these questions of the, more, of the wiser use of institutional resources, there are opportunities to have more intelligent state policies. And I'll just quickly touch on this. Those opportunities are largely in the area of student financial aid. And how do we help students pay for the higher tuition which is now a permanent fact of life. We're not going to go back to a low tuition policy. Questions like, OK, with the existing dollars we have, if we let particularly low income students know in the eighth grade that they will be funded to go on to college if they qualify, would that increase the number of low income families that actually see higher education as a practical possibility? On the other end, if students are going to have to pay a lot of tuition, is there a way that we could structure state financial aid so that students can pay for that tuition from the earnings after they graduate, assuming that they have high-income jobs afterwards? There are lots of interesting possibilities that could be explored. And finally, if we really want to reach a desirable state goal in terms of the educated citizen, remember those million college graduates we need? Uh, we ought to adopt a state dream act that says whether you're documented or not, if you graduated from high school in California and you want to go on to college, we need you, we want you, we will treat you all the same. Uh, some of the things I've mentioned make sense, and some don't. Uh, virtually all of them are controversial, and the unhappy fact, as Dennis mentioned, is that our mechanisms for legislative and institutional debates on these issues are extremely weak. There were once members of the California leg legislature who were experts on higher education. No longer. Term limits limit their learning curves. In the assembly, they're out in six years. And frankly, there's no big campaign contributions to be raised by being an expert in higher education. Depending on your party preference, we have not had a governor who paid sustained attention to higher education since either Ronald Reagan or Pat Brown. And in the case of Ronald Reagan, the university didn't particularly like the attention that it got. <laughs> we can hope for better with, with Jerry Brown, but it's, it's too soon to say. At the institutional level, the capacity 
for tough-minded examination of unpleasant alternatives is very small. The disappointing experience of the Commission on the Future of the University of California is just the most recent evidence in that regard. So to summarize, as a state, we have failed to set goals for the number of college-educated Californians that we need. We have paid little or no attention to the enormous waste of student time and taxpayer resources in our current system, that is the student dropouts before educational goals are realized. Third, we have no coherent plan to increase both college access and success, especially for low-income students. And four, we have no unit of the executive or legislative branch of state government other than a small unit in the legislative analyst's office that is deeply informed about higher education issues and prepared to engage in some fresh thinking. Now for the optimism. <laughs> Our policies stink, and they're not likely to get much better. And as a policy kind of person, I just think of policies. Policies are important, budgets are important, appropriations are important, but people are important too. And the universe, and let me speak specifically about the University of California, although I think the remarks also bear in part on the other elements of public higher education. The University of California has two things that many other institutions would kill to have and don't have. First, the state and the nation knows that the University of California and higher education are critical to the future. Now you say, well, that in a phone call, you know, 35 cents will get us a phone call. No, the, the respect and confidence that the university has is not going to result in significantly higher appropriations in the near future. But that respect is important in, among other things, the, the willingness to let the university sort through its own problems without imposing solutions from the outside. The second thing the university has is a lot of smart, creative, hardworking people. And many of them are dedicated people. About 25 years ago, when I worked in the president's office, uh, I heard something that I've always remembered. I was talking with Bud Scheidt, who's the former dean of business on this campus, former vice president of the university, a very wise man, and we were going through some budget problems, which now look like a walk in the park. And I was moaning and groaning about what the, you know, the future of the university. And Bud said, Steve, has it ever occurred to you that we have lots of institutions in our society and lots of employers in our society, but very few of them have people who wear the name of the institution on their sweatshirt. Very few of those institutions have fight songs. Very few of those institutions have homecomings. And none of those institutions have reunions. So why is that important? Those things exist at the university because we transform lives. People care about this place deeply. This is not just a pickle factory. <laughs> yes, with budget cuts and uncertainty, there are going to be some valuable people who leave the University of California. They're not getting the salary they want. They're not getting the pensions they want. There's too much uncertainty. But you know what? Many good people are going to stay. And many good people are going to join them. There are dedicated people in this room, I won't embarrass them by pointing them out, who care deeply about the University of California and the values it stands for, the young people that it works with. For them, this is not just a job. This is a calling. <laughs> and over the next 10 years, as the travail of the university continues, as it will for higher education in the state, it's those people who are going to stay. And they will come to represent a larger and larger proportion of the leadership of this university, both at an administrative and faculty level. I'm thinking about lots of different people, but I'm particularly thinking about associate professors. Their attitudes are going to be different. They will seize opportunities. They will work together in new ways. They will use technology in new ways. I'm reminded of the fact that in uh, the Great Depression, 1935, Berkeley was, for all intents and purposes, the University of California. There was no other general campus. And this camp 
This campus took it hard in the Depression. Faculty took a big pay cut. There were students who dropped out because they didn't have enough money for food. But the university persisted. And 10 years later, at the, with the end of World War II, Berkeley was prepared, and not simply because of the physicists, Berkeley was prepared to become a world-class university just 10 years later because it had leadership that was dedicated to this institution and was prepared to work through the problems and to stick with the values that they held dear. University of California is going to survive. And who knows, someday folks may look back and say, this was the turning point when many good things started to happen. Thank you.